So now we, we need to start taking questions from the audience. And there's one here, uh, I think it's, it looks like it can, it, it can go either way, um, especially the immigration lawyers, uh, which, you, which you all are. So I think we haven't heard uh, from Ms. Mweni for a while, but it seems like you have answered, but let me read it just so that everybody else can hear it. What are the chances of a B1, B2, who has overstayed his visa status getting a green card through marriage in today's political environment? Ms. Mweni, go ahead. Yeah, so like I said, the, the political climate has changed, but the law has not changed. Okay. Uh, and, you know, Mr. Matemu said, do not be afraid. I think the biggest thing that has changed during this time is that a lot of fear mongering. There's a lot of things, oh my goodness, it's not going to work. That is absolutely not true. Um, Mr. Matemu broke it down about all the different avenues that you have. I always tell people, you're going to go home because you want to go home. If you want to fight, you can fight. Be your biggest advocate right? You can, be, I mean, a removal order is not the end of the world. There's ways that you can stay in this country and you get on that plane and go home, do it because you want to, but there's resources available, there's recourse um, all the way up to the Supreme Court, but it's not over until you want it to be over, right? Be your biggest advocate and fight for yourself. So yes, B1, B2, absolutely. You can be able to um, do the um, applications and you will be successful. Just get good legal counsel. The problem that we have at the diaspora is that we think that um, it's a you know, one piece meal. You know, I'll come to Pande, he got married, he filed an I-130 or 485 or you know, I-131 and I'll, co I'll copy the exact same thing. It's cheaper to do it, um, to spend the money up front, get a consultation, um, get good legal counsel and get help to do it right, as opposed for you to be unsuccessful, get in trouble, and then I'll go and try to hire somebody to fix your problems. It's frustrating. I'm like, listen, had you come to me two months ago, we would not be at this situation. So it's not a one piece meal. Just because somebody else was successful this way doesn't mean it'll absolutely work for me. Be your advocate, get informed, be knowledgeable, and it absolutely can work. So I don't think the, the political climate has changed the law. It absolutely has not. And you can be um, uh, successful. Can I add, Prof, real quick in terms yeah. of the B1, B2 situation? Yeah. So if you're, and I think the question was specific to an issue of a family-based petition where your spouse is petitioning for you. So we have to understand that the premise under which the application is adjudicated is that there was a legitimate marriage, that there was a bona fide marriage, and that is the basis on the, 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 the file being adjudicated. Now, recently, there has been debate in terms of how long does it take for someone, for an officer, uh, for any reasonable person to say, well, you've been married for this long period of time, and so therefore now this appears legitimate. Now, that's not really what the law says. The law says at inception of the marriage, what was your intent? What was both of you's intent? And so if you entered into the marriage with ulterior and nefarious intent, so obviously then it doesn't pass the test of what is supposed to be a spouse or petition. So whether you have overstayed is not the issue. Focus on what the issue is. Is your marriage a legitimate, bona fide marriage that qualifies under the law for a spouse to petition for you? Okay. Do, do any of you want to add anything, Jafet, or anything? Oh, that's uh, good for now. We can move to another question. Okay. Uh, you, you, you're not, uh, let me unmute you, Jafet. You were not unmuted. Oh, no, I think those, those, those answers are perfect. Um, as a... Uh, Council of Mweni and uh, Council of Pandey have said, the law has not changed. The Immigration Nationality Act has not changed. They, they can be tinkering around with policies around it, you know, introduce new, ha make it a little difficult, uh, make it a little more expensive around the ages, but the core uh, eligibility uh, requirements don't change, except the only thing that has changed is basically policy, is a public charge issue. Okay. Okay. And it's about it's a policy, not law. Okay. That's the only thing, but it remains the same. And again, uh, the way the question was asked there is, uh, and, I, and full disclosure, you know, I'm not giving any legal advice here, but I'm saying the way the question was asked was, what are my chances of remaining in the country and I want to be two visa and I get married? That's a wrong premise. And as, as uh, Mr. Opandia said, 
that should not be the thought process. All right, and then uh, this summer, as you know, there are a number of uh, F1 students that are going to graduate and start applying for OPT. Uh, are you seeing backlogs in the government's ability to process uh, optional practical training? And, and, and given the high unemployment uh, numbers, is it going to affect appro approvals of OPT? Uh, on my part, I haven't done, I, I, I don't really do those uh, OPTs. I think I'll let the question be answered by somebody who practices in that area directly. Yeah, because I think it's a general well, question. Well, on, on, the, Go ahead. on the most part, OPTs are processed through the institutions uh, that you attend. The premise behind OPT is that you will be gaining practical experience in the area of study that you've been undertaking uh, in your course. And so now the law is allowing you, because on the most part, you're not allowed to work as an F1 student, so on this op under the OPT, you can work outside of the school uh, and be paid, but really it's more about gaining practical experience. Now, there are certain guidelines you have to meet. There's a deadline that you have to submit your application uh, um, through the school, that you have to be graduating, you know, you're in your last semester of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of your program uh, before you graduate and so forth. So it's for you, the student, to go to your, uh, again, as for a student, go to your school, uh, talk to your student advisor, the international student advisor, and tell them that this is what you want. And don't wait until the last minute. If you already know you're going to graduate next semester, start working on it now. They'll give you, they do it all the time, so they know exactly what they need to give you. And, so, and then you, you submit it on time. Now, in terms of the numbers, whether they are being approved or denied or the numbers have changed. I don't think that uh, we, we are, uh, we've lived long enough uh, to make that deduction because uh, we're still in the, in the mix uh, and middle of uh, COVID-19. Uh, I think that's something that is going to come down the line to see how they're moving. Now, we also, logically, we should uh, agree that everyone is affected in terms of how they function, including government. So some of the government officers who process this, for example, we know uh, they, work in, they, they work from home. I had an officer call me, actually they called me on my cell phone and they told me they were working from home on a particular case. And I was really impressed that uh, they were doing that. But um, generally we should expect that there will be some kind of backlog um, on these cases. And if I can also add on just a little something small about the immigration cases and especially those which are in removal proceedings. Uh, the, the government has been sending notices uh, about rescheduling uh, of those cases. So please check your mail. And the other problem is we know mail has been delayed somewhat. So call the 800 number, uh, go to your lawyer and see if they have received any notices about rescheduling. And, and, and also they do post them online. The government has, if you go to USCIS uh, website, uh, they have given some information about uh, rescheduled dates uh, and so forth. So uh, just go out there, don't sit and don't do nothing. Just go do your own little research in terms of what you need to know so that you can start working on your, on your case. The question was, you know, what is the advice to be given to F1 students set to graduate in the summer when it comes to applying for OPT? The advice is apply for OPT. Um, it's a, uh, you know, Mr. Pond has talked about the fact that this is mostly done by the school. So contact international student advisor and absolutely apply. The fact that there's COVID or not, the fact that you're working or a job is available or not doesn't prevent you from applying for the OPT. So absolutely proceed with the application of it. Yeah, Ms. Mwendi, there's a question you answered there from uh, Gerono on uh, uh, an individual who does not meet the guidelines for permanent residency. If you have it on your screen, can you read it and uh, respond to it? for the purpose of everybody hearing something. Mm. Oh, Gerona, do you want to ask it? No, I had a follow-up question with that, with what she just answered, because I know the students are given a set, I think three months to get a job, if they don't get a job within that time frame. So are they penalized because of COVID, there may be a delay, are they still gonna be held to that given time frame? Because I think there's a time that if they don't get a job, they have to exit the country. I Is that for that, me? Go ahead. No, sorry. Yeah, so uh, 
again, we are living in uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of these things we'll get to learn as time goes by. Under normal circumstances, we already have existing laws and guidelines on how things operate. Now we are having new scenarios. So some of these things, they are going to obviously be different from how it has been. The key thing here is not to worry too much, but at the same time, not to sit and don't do anything. So you still have to mitigate your situation by finding out what you need to do. Whether you need to go online and research, call immigration office, call your student advisor, call your lawyer, and then they can find specific to your situation what needs to be done. I think that's the best advice I can give. All right. So the issue was to come up right now, you know, what is today, May 8th, that I haven't been able to um, get a job, then absolutely there's a reason for that. You know, there's a stay at home order that has been in place where we're not able to get employment. But how will this become an issue in November or December? I really can't tell. I think there are things that will just play them by ear. But once the um, case comes up about the fact what has prevented you from complying with the law, um, I'm pretty sure there'll be solutions at that time. But if it would come up right now, absolutely. That would not be an issue. You're not supposed to leave right now. They, they, you know, they, what hindered me from getting the employment was COVID. That would be understandable. So Michael, there's a question here for you. Does uh, chapter 13 bankruptcy affect one's credit record? How long does it take to recover from the negative effects of such a bankruptcy? Michael. Yes, yes, th thank you. Yes, so chapter that any bankruptcy, definitely it's going to go on your record. So um, bankruptcy stays on your record for anywhere, maybe seven to perhaps 10 years. But the good thing about it is, so far as your record is concerned, is it wipes out all your debts. So if you had any unsecured debts, so, you know, credit cards, you know, you had a medical emergency, um, you know, any kind of a loan, personal loan, car loans, whatever, those will be wiped out. The only things that you can't really wipe out are the IRS, uh, maybe things to do with the student loans and, you know, such, which are usually the easier loans to manage, for, for example, student loans. So with that, so after you wipe out all your unsecured debts, which most of the time from my experience, that forms the majority because what happens is people keep, it's like taking from Peter to pay Paul and you get into this cycle and it just piles up. So people have maybe 50,000, 100,000, credit cards and personal loan debts, all this is wiped away. So that gives them such a relief. So with that, then you can start what I would call personal restructuring. So despite having a bankruptcy on your record, believe it or not, there'll be creditors who will look at that and say, you know what? I think this is a good candidate because you know what? I'm not competing with anybody. The other guys have gone away. So you're starting afresh. Of course, you start to have building your, start building your credit. So what I would advise is maybe get a secured card. You know, you start building it up. But you'd be surprised within maybe a year or less or a couple of months, you start seeing the same things coming in the mail. You know, apply for this, get this, get this loan. So just don't be tempted, but it's a, it's a way to get a fresh start. Yeah, there's another question here that was directed at Ms. Mweni, but since you are on that track, let me ask it to you and then Ms. Mweni can add to it. Uh, with regard to yes. workers' compensation, employers are required to provide safe working environment and are liable for safety and health, uh, the health of employees. Please, can you comment uh, about that in relation to COVID-19? In other words, I think is the issue you were talking about OSHA, Alion, Michael, as uh, COVID-19 yes. relaxed OSHA regulations or not? Um, so... A lot of it, that is yet to be seen because just like Laban said, this is uncharted territory. So, um, you know, people are opening up, um, but so far as preventing, you know, virus infection, I believe that is something most employers did not contemplate, you know, the social distancing, uh, you know, wiping your workstation every, I don't know, 30 minutes or whatever. And how remote or not in terms of tort law that even in terms of proof, how do you prove that you got it here and not you know, somewhere else? So there's a lot of issues. 
But uh, one thing that might happen, there's also debate about sort of good Samaritan protection. So let's say, you know, I run a healthcare related business. So um, like, you know, nursing or this caregiver, you know, such kind of stuff. Um, there could be some sort of good Samaritan protection for healthcare providers because, I mean, this is an emergency. I mean, nurses have to do their job. You cannot make them scared of, you know, hey. So it's still subject to debate, but, you know, if you run a healthcare, maybe you have a better chance, but like I said, it's still uncharted territory. Okay, we're gonna go to uh, um, um, I think just I mean on that. I think that is a very um, interesting, the litigator in me thinking, that's a very um, interesting issue about whether or not COVID-19 could be a compensable, right? So in workers' compensation, we say that um, compensation is given for occupational diseases that arise out of the course of employment, right? Okay. But many states like North Carolina would exclude common diseases like the common flu. So I can make the argument that, you know, if I represent the insurance company, um, I could make the argument that this is like the common flu, that it is excluded and is not an occupational disease. But if I represented the um, nurse or I represented the grocery store worker, absolutely it's an occupational disease. I got sick because I doggone came to work. So I think that would be a really good, you know, interesting issue to litigate on, on, on both issues, on both sides of the case. I, I, would, I would say this, Prof. Okay. Um, the, 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 I mean, and people are debating out there on all these issues. How can you, with certainty, tell where you contracted the virus from? Okay. I mean, I can, that I is just. I that can is, tell how I came out from my house, and the only place I went to was a Walmart, and I checked people out, and then I came straight home. But, counsel, the virus, as we've been told, can have an incubation period of more than 14 days. You can also have it as a carrier where it does not actually manifest. Your husband may have had it at home. It just never showed up. You got it from home and brought it to work. So mm -hmm. how are you going to show that the workplace is where you have contracted the disease? In my In situation, I have been staying at home and following the order my husband has been home and I've only been going to Walmart and I can give you my calendar that I've kept for the past 14 days. And that is the only place I've been as an essential worker. Good luck with that. But my thing about in terms of tort law, there is something we call proximate causation. Show me the nexus between your injury and my action, my negligence. It is going to be difficult to show you. But for the purpose of the issue of occupation um, law, in terms of I mean, employment law, in terms of your occupation, I think perhaps the medics, the people in um, uh, nursing facilities and hospitals, uh, they may have a better chance of uh, trying to show that um, they, they were exposed at the workplace. But even then, to be able to pin down the employer and say that it's the employer who has uh, caused or not uh, availed um, uh, whatever precautions is also going to be very, very difficult. Now, going forward, I think there's going to be a lot of things that are going to change, especially in terms of the OSHA laws. Uh, right now, as we know, even uh, the size of the door, the size between the distance between one cubicle to the next. Uh, the, the, the size of a window, all those things are regulated by, uh, the, by state law in terms of construction and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they, they, all this is going to have to change because uh, if you work in an assembly line and the assembly line is designed whereby you do one piece and you pass on to the next person and pass on to the next person. Now the ergonomics of it will, is going to have to be changed, whereby you have six feet between you and the next person, and so forth. I think that will take time to um, implement. And then we have a competing issue, uh, which we all know about the economy. The economy is suffering, and we're trying to get people back to work and be able to uh, uh, feed their families and contribute to the building of the country. And so when you have all these limitations in terms of the work environment, it's obviously going to be quite a challenge. But in any event, 
Uh, we shall be learning as we go. In fact, I think that's how we have been since COVID-19 came to this country. Uh, one week sounds like three or four months. Uh, one day sounds like two. Sometimes I get confused whether are we on Monday, are we on Friday, simply because a lot is happening just within a very short time. Yeah, so let me, let me move to another question here real quickly. Um, um, even, even educational institutions like universities are, um, are laying off people and some of them were given these uh, work visas, yeah? So, so for the immigration lawyers, if an institution requires you to vacate your position, let's say it was a teaching position, they don't have the money to pay you. Even, even any tenure track position is basically contingent upon the institution having money to pay you. Mm -hmm. So if you are on a work permit, and then they are asking to lay you off, does it affect your work permit? How much grace period do you have? So that is one question. The other one that I think is related, but if I'm wrong, counsel, so you can correct me. Has COVID-19 affected processing of NIW in any way? Who'd like to go for that? So let me- Okay, if I could just- Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Matemu. Uh, let me start with NIW. Um, first of all, as we said, the law has not changed at all. Okay. okay? So I do not see exactly how uh, COVID-19 really uh, impacts, uh, you know, the national interest waivers that um, because basically we are saying no regulation has changed, no laws have changed. What, are, what might have changed is just the practicalities of how those things are going to be processed. That will have to do with manpower, it will have to do with funding, it will have to do with closings and things like that. So I do not, I do not see how that, um, how national interest waivers are, um, in my opinion, how, how that has changed. Um, the other question was, like somebody has been laid off and things like that. In my opinion, I do not think there's somebody who can provide a clear answer as to what will happen. Because if we follow the laws and regulations, you know what, what happens if there was no COVID-19. Now, because of COVID-19, Okay. That has thrown all the rules out of the window. So I don't think it is possible to responsibly like tell people exactly what's going to happen. All right. And then uh, there's another question that has come here. Um, uh, if I can read it. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going up and down so that we can involve as many uh, responses here as possible. What, what uh, options do employees have? I think, uh, uh, Michael, you can start answering this one. What options do employees have when the employer insists that they do not have to use a face mask at work? This is happening with some restaurants. Um, it insists that they do not? Yeah, Could you repeat not. the question? Yeah, um, what, what options do employees have when, an, when the employer insists that they do not have to use a face mask, ma face mask at work? This is happening with some restaurants. Oh, really? I haven't had in, of that particular situation, but I thought the opposite would be what would obtain mostly. Like they're saying you have to use a face mask. Yeah. But here's a situation where your employer is saying don't use a face mask. Uh, if that is the case, then um, I think that's really dicey because that's really clearly opening up yourself, you know, to litigation and I mean that's a case that you can argue now you're telling me to expose myself you are mandating me to expose myself um, that would not be a really wise move if, if I was advising the employer of the small business yeah. you know there could be economic reasons for doing it but you're really really exposing yourself especially when you start putting in such policies then that issue of remoteness um, you know might not give you a cover you know, when you start doing, you know, stuff like that. I think that's but what, uh, if, if, if I may add, uh, Prof, and yeah. this kind of goes to what uh, my dear counsel when he was talking about uh, in terms of uh, uh, where did you contract, um, okay. you know, your, 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 the virus from. So in this kind of scenario, uh, if I were the employee, uh, if I, if you subject me to that and, and I contract uh, the virus, God forbid, then for sure you, are, you will be the one and the only one uh, who has given me the virus if I'm to contract it. So I think that will be a very good uh, case against the employer. But let me comment uh, generally about employment, uh, employment law. 
And I know that um, the advent of this virus in terms of uh, the workplace uh, is going to cause a lot of problems uh, on an already existing uh, community. And I'm talking about the immigrant community, uh, the minority communities in the workplace. Now, they ha we do have both federal and state laws uh, which are anti-discrimination in nature in terms of uh, you cannot discriminate against uh, national origin, uh, uh, against race, gender, uh, religion, and they're all listed. They're called the Title VII uh, civil rights um, um, uh, that uh, uh, great MLK and, and the rest fought for, and they became law in the, in the late 60s. Now, those laws prohibit discrimination. The problem is discrimination sometimes is a very subtle uh, offense in that you really can't uh, see it. I mean, you, you know it, you see it, you feel it, but you just cannot put it on paper and describe it. Now, there is a, a possibility that some employers are going to use this opportunity, this inopportune uh, COVID-19 to start getting rid of people that they don't like or that they had had issues with in the first place prior to COVID-19. And it's going to be very difficult to fight back in terms of uh, discrimination because uh, they're only going to purely base it on the economics of it. Mm. Uh, so what I would suggest is if you think you're being discriminated, uh, have a record of your discrimination. In other words, keep uh, keep a tally of events, dates, keep a journal of um, things that are happening to you, uh, that your employer, your boss, uh, your job is doing that you believe are discriminatory. Uh, and that's often how you're able to overcome a discrimination case. Uh, but post COVID-19, I think it's going to be quite a challenge because if I hated you before COVID-19 and now it's here and I, I've been wanting to get rid of you, now is a perfect time to, um, to let you go. Uh, but for now, at least be informed. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you're, you're the best, you're your own best advocate uh, in terms of uh, watching out for yourself. So let me go to Ms. Mweni here and, and, uh, if, and then maybe you can pass it on to uh, uh, another council if you, if you wish. This is the question of adoption. Uh, what does a, a person in the diaspora I need to know to adapt a child from Kenya. I could be wrong, but I think I may have heard there is a recent policy in Kenya that they're not allowing foreign adoptions, but I could be wrong. I'm Um, I don't think it's recent. We've had this issue for quite a while. Um, you cannot do the adoption for, for immigration purposes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Matemu is licensed in Kenya as well. He can you know, give us some more information for that. Uh, Mr. Andre handles a lot of that in our office, uh, but the adoption for immigration purposes um, cannot happen with Kenya. I think that's the case. Mwen is right. Okay, so that's a close chapter, even if you're a Kenyan uh, immigrant in the US, because I mean, or that doesn't give you anything. What, what happens now is they consider you to be an American. Sorry, say that again? No, I mean, I mean, I think part of the reason why this is coming up is uh, somebody's thinking that I'm a Kenyan immigrant. Now I live in the U.S. I should be able to adapt. No, I mean the issue here is the what are you if you are you if you are adopting the child for immigration uh, purposes, hmm. all right? Because you're adopting so that you can uh, move the child from Kenya and bring them to the U.S. That is what uh, is the issue. But if you're adopting a child and the child lives in Kenya right and uh, nothing stops you that's happening every day uh in kenya uh so it's the element here is after you do the adoption what do you want to do hmm. so adopting the child in kenya and later on starting the process of bringing them to the u.s i still run to the same issues is basically what you're saying it, it, it was right. a dead end right so unless the law changes and uh, i must say i'm not i'm, I'm zero qualified to speak hmm. on kenyan law uh, then unless the law changes in Kenya, then you can adopt uh, for purposes of, you know, if you want to identify the child as your child, so you can be able to uh, uh, um, get whatever it is that you want to get as your child, then that's okay. Uh, what we're saying is 
if you are here and your intent is to adopt so that you can file for them to uh, to migrate from Kenya to the US, then that's where you're gonna run into a problem. All right, well, thank you. So then there's another question here um, um, that is basically asking uh, pretty much more, all of you to, especially the immigration lawyers, um, uh, in terms of uh, the options that are available for permanent and the EB1, um, uh, I, I guess, migration. Uh, have those changed? And, and I think because part of what they're saying here, if, and unless I misunderstand the question is uh, in times of high unemployment like now, it might very well be challenging to get somebody who is willing to sponsor you. Isn't that the case? Can okay. I rephrase it? Yeah. So if, 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 if a faculty is hired and they were, you know, the, 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 the institution has agreed to file for them, but in the process of filing the farm, paperwork, they find that there is something that was missing. Like, you know, for example, there's one of the qualifications that they did not meet. So if the person is denied based on that, the fact that they did not meet all the qualifications, therefore other qualified members may have been discouraged from applying because of that. And they're given options to one is to rehire or the next option is EB1. Which one would you recommend? And if they were to go for the rehire, and they were to vacate their position, would that affect their work permit? Ooh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, and I haven't followed it, but I will okay. answer. You want me to repeat it? <laughs> you want me to no, repeat it? Okay. That is true as well, but there's a lot going on with the question. Um, yes. you, I love EB1s. You have a PhD, listen do something about it, right? The NIW is there. Remember the law has not changed, right? So this has got nothing to do with COVID. If you're eligible for it, absolutely go ahead and apply. You're saying that you're ineligible to apply for PERM, but they're asking you for you to get rehired? So they're giving you two options. They're like, okay, because there was something that was missing. So therefore, one day level on looks at that, they're like, no, you don't qualify because of that. There was something that was missed. So you didn't have that qualification. Therefore, you are not the best candidate. Now you're given two options, rehire. If you are given the rehire, if you have to vacate your position in order for us to advertise that position, will that affect you, your, your work status, your, your work permit? Because that means you're leaving your job to step out so that they can re-advertise your position. And the last one is, if you go for EB1, that is very ambiguous because what is this that is an outstanding. What does that outstanding mean? How Again, good you ten, there's 10 different things that you can be okay. able, you only have three okay. of them. And then now I have a question about what is that one thing that you did not qualify for? How does it apply to this other thing? I think that's very fact specific. What is it that makes you disqualified for so, it? So for but, example, yeah, okay, sure. I'll let so whatever, you go. I, I would take what I'm eligible for, if I'm eligible to be able to get uh, my H-1B, absolutely I would apply for it. That doesn't make you ineligible at the same time or after that while that is pending to do your NIW. I don't think our outstanding is ambiguous at all. Okay. Well, I, I think this is a tough question that uh, 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 Mr. Teach, you may have to uh, call one-on-one -on -one so that okay. the specific can be found. Because I, from what I hear you're saying, uh, the first issue is being asked to step away from the job, then what becomes of their status? That's, exactly. that's one thing you ask. Exactly. exactly. And then, right. And then the second thing is, uh, if, they, if they ask to reapply, uh, is there any chance or guarantee that they're going to get that position? Okay. Which now it's going to be open to everyone. And then now, uh, what are the options beyond uh, that same specific um, uh, position they had? What other options can they fall to? Can they default sure. to outside sure. of that? Right. Sure. So I, I think, um, like uh, my good counsel, I haven't had that scenario, but like I said, I think, like I counsel said, you may have to look at specific facts on that candidate to see uh, what can they, what would be their options in that scenario? As to what the immigration status, um, what befalls the immigration status, I'm not quite sure that I know and I can give you an answer to that, um, but it can be researched and, and, and uh, then you are guided as to what, what happens to their, 
to their immigration status um, if, if that falls to that person. Okay, I'll follow up with my fellow ego, yeah. ego pride. Yeah. <laughs> I'll follow up with you. Yeah. All right. I'll follow up with you. Yeah, yeah. So there's another question here, and then we are we are looking at uh, we are at 10:51, so we'll be coming around for closing comments here shortly. So you can at least cancel. You can begin thinking about them. But there's one question here: uh, whether you have seen situations where illegal immigrants are being denied treatment uh, under this uh, COVID-19 situation, and if that is the case, uh, um, what can they do to get help? Uh, I think this applies to a lot of other people who may have actually even fallen out of status. And now they are hiding, but actually they do need help. Um, so so, so well, we, can, we, can, we can come to Jafet here. One second, let me unmute you. Jafet, go ahead. Okay, well, I have not done a survey. Yeah. Uh, so I cannot say whether they have been denied or not, but I'll tell you this. I, um, your immigration status does not affect your ability to go to a health provider uh, you know, in, in any public, um, you know, in any private hospital, private hospital, to get some help. The, you know, your immigration status is not; um, it does not matter at all. Okay, so uh, there are other people, you know, even people without insurance or anything like that. I don't think the COVID nineteen changes the situation as it was in terms of access to to healthcare. It's all a matter of resources. Like you know, it, it's it's what everybody's you know. Where all the institutions are going through. Uh, the health institutions have been overworked, they have been overstretched, they do not have enough supplies, they don't have enough. So everybody's in the same situation. So I don't think any immigrants or non-immigrants have been singled out uh, in this situation for denial of uh, health funds. And I think they've been very specific and clear that immigration status is not an issue. And absolutely, I mean, this COVID is it's nothing to take lightly. Um, yeah. So not requesting for immigration status is even places are not even going to request for payment for it. So absolutely do get uh, medical treatment about the issue of whether or not you're concerned about the issue of public charge and immigration is not to be concerned as far as COVID is concerned. Yeah, and the other thing I'll say uh, from a, uh, because I study uh, some of these things under population geography, uh, if I get sick as an illegal immigrant, I actually put Americans in danger. So, so it's actually in everybody's best interest from a public health right. standpoint to actually seek treatment. Uh, so so and, and there, there are times when we really have to do that and not to worry about, oh, I'm going to be deported. No, we, we do need to protect public health. Yeah, I'll jump in there and mention something that happened in California. Yeah. In yes. fact, some, some people went to court and said that, you know, and started bringing issues about, you know, illegal immigrants being included in um, in uh, you know COVID nineteen related assistance from the state, and the, I, I believe the California Supreme Court you know uh, decided that you know that that kind of con uh, concern had no merit and it was you know it it was struck down. So I do not think that even it matters at all because for the reasons that you have just stated, COVID nineteen doesn't know if you are an immigrant, you are a non immigrant, you are white or black. If you know, it's like education. If you if you deny it to some people, you are actually you know creating a danger to the rest of the you know American population. All right. So, so uh, let me let me let me just add real quick in terms of uh, uh, we know as we've been reading out there that there have been hate related uh, crimes uh, as a, as a, as a, as of uh, the advent of uh, COVID nineteen, and it had been there before but there has been an increase of some sort. And we've seen it here in this country and we've seen it elsewhere in other countries whereby uh, people get um, open discrimination and in some instances uh, actually get assaulted uh, because of the belief uh, that because of you have a certain uh, origin or, or color, then you, you, you are either carrying the, the virus or, or, or something like that. So with that, I think it's a matter of us using our common sense in uh, how we handle ourselves everywhere we are. Now, you can, may not be able to change, you know, what somebody has in their mind and how they were raised in, in terms of perceiving other human beings. Uh, but you certainly can use common sense and be proactive in making sure you don't find yourself in an environment that you are becoming a victim of a hate crime. Uh, but having that, having said that, we already know that a crime is a crime. So therefore, if you think it has happened, then 
just go ahead and report it to the authorities and uh, and hopefully the authorities will pick it up and uh, uh, prosecute the case against uh, whoever the perpetrator is. Exactly. So let's uh, move on to closing comments here. And uh, this is a, a chance, Council, to maybe comment on anything that I did, not, I did not give you a chance to say something on that perhaps came to mind because we're at 10.56, so we want to start winding down. Uh, so, Michael, you, you haven't uh, spoken for a while. Um, what would you consider to be your closing statement uh, as we start to close down? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, 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 just, you know, thank you for putting all this together. Um, I would uh, just maybe encourage the Kenyan diaspora community to, you know, I've also, I'm a lawyer and I've learned a few things here as well. So, you know, just feel free to reach out, you know, reach out to Laban or reach out to uh, any one of us. Uh, we'll, we'll be happy to assist. Um, also, in terms of, you know, small business, in terms of individual resources, so far as COVID is concerned, uh, yeah, don't be shy. Um, whenever you can, you know, apply for these things. Um, uh, I know people try to, kind of the immigrant community, you know, sort of quote unquote operate under the radar, you know, especially in this environment. Uh, as all the other panelists have said, not everything will put you in jeopardy in terms of seeking help, in terms, especially economic help, or in terms of, you know, either it's state provided or SBA or a loan. So don't be, don't be too shy and don't suffer alone pretty much. Reach out to the community. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Mwen, you can uh, say something as we close. Yes, thank you for the opportunity um, to speak and to um, um, share with the Kenyan community. The biggest thing, um, just to cover up and to say, is that just know your rights. And the biggest thing that I tell people to do is exercise your right to remain silent. You see it on TV, but when you get pulled over by the police, you have too many things to tell them, right? When you're doing all these applications by yourself, you're trying to go to court by yourself, you're speaking too much. Exercise your right to remain silent. It is beneficial, it is actually cheaper to retain an attorney and get help um, other than having an issue and coming back trying to fix it. So exercise your right to remain silent, educate yourself, be your biggest and greatest advocate. The lawyer does not know everything. Um, like Mr. Michael said, you know, you can learn things regardless of being a lawyer or not. So your facts are different, your situation is different when you come in to work with a lawyer and um, come in as a partnership and work together to be able to um, get the results. And it is not over until it is over. People are giving up. People are scared. There's so much rumor mongering going, going on, you know? People have lived under the radar all these years and things have been, you know, okay. This is not the time to continue to do the same thing. This is a time to get out there and get some help. You've been here 20 years and documented, then don't do another 20 years, right? This is the time, this is the climate, this is the political climate to do something different. And only you can be able to get, make that first step and be able to get yourself some help. Um, as far as the businesses are concerned, that is the best way to do something for yourself. You don't want to jeopardize the fact that you're, you know, um, uh, filling in I-9s or what have you, but you can be able to be self-employed. Most of us come here um, and are documented and get visas and enter the country. We are educated, we are smart, start businesses, do something for yourself. Um, and do not be in the shadows, do not be afraid. And it's over because you want it to be over. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Jaffet uh, Matemo, uh, closing uh, statement. Yes, I just thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mweni. That was really, um, you said a lot of things that I also, I also wanted to say. But what I want to say is this. This is a country with a lot of regulations and a lot of systems, a lot of courts. There's a lot of respect for the rule of law for the most part and things like that. Use the system to your advantage. Do not, do not find it, do not be afraid. Do not look at it and be overwhelmed by anything. If you go to immigration court and you're ordered removed, that is just like the first step. You know, appeal your case to the BIA. I mean, the case could be there for another four years. Something happened at the BIA, you are not satisfied, you know, take your case to the circuit court, to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. The case can lie there for years. 
there are so many other rights and, and rules and complicated um, regulations and laws and things like that. Everybody takes advantage of the system. Learn the system, get involved with those people who know the system, use the system to your advantage and make sure that you, um, you pursue all the rights that are available to you. Just because you are an immigrant in this country does not mean you lose your rights to due process, okay, or equal protection under the law or under any protection provided by the United States Constitution. If anything has happened to you, a lot of Africans and people from the diaspora, they are cowed. Their boss tells them something and they say, oh my God, you know, or a police officer, like when he said, pulls you over and you think it's time for you to tell your entire story to him. A police officer is not there to defend you. His job is to arrest you. So anything you tell him, he can use it against you. He can, he pretends to be a friend and send you to jail. And basically you'll be convicted on everything that you told the police officer. So one, do not do stuff yourself. Go to those people who know, get expert advice and use the system to your advantage. And, meet, and remember, you have a right to litigate your rights everywhere in where your rights can be litigated or where you know, your rights can be protected. So don't forget about it. It's not daunting. You have the same right, almost entirely the same rights under the Constitution of the United States as somebody who is a citizen. Okay, there are only a few things that you, you know, that you have some rights you don't have, but do not be afraid. Go ahead and protect your rights entirely. Do not fear to go to court. Do not fear to file cases in court. Don't fear to appeal. Don't fear, you know, to go to the district court, the federal courts and file your cases there until you're satisfied that all your rights have been mitigated. So don't give up. And another thing I wanted to say is, Guys, we have talked about the effects of COVID-19 and how it's affecting different um, areas of uh, people's lives, economic, you know, health-wise, you know, in terms of jobs and all that. But the first thing that you need to remember is try not to get infected. That, that changes everything. Follow the guidelines from your health um, professionals, from the federal government, the, the, the part of the federal government that can be trusted. I mean, follow their, their, their advice, follow your state, your local thing, protect your family, do everything right, so don't get infected in the first place. But, but anybody that has been infected needs our compassion, needs our support, needs uh, to know that they are not alone. So do not abandon our own people just because they got infected, they're in hospital and things like that. Let's stay this thing together and do what has been recommended. And again, thank you so much for, to the panel, everybody that organized this and I, I am really really glad and honored to have been a participant here thank you thank you we come to mr opande yeah thank you very much uh, professor tiso and i know i've been speaking quite a bit uh, so i beg um, uh, my pardon to whoever who may i may have offended in the process uh, but i want to thank you in particular for hosting this and moderating this event I'm also very grateful to Kesa uh, because I understand they were part of the process of arranging uh, this. I'm also wanting to uh, thank my fellow panelists for the wealth of knowledge that they have shared with us. Uh, in fact, um, my hope and prayer is that we can have similar uh, engagements, periodical engagements that we, um, we share with our community about uh, legal issues that they need to be aware about. Uh, we do have an organization of lawyers here in the U.S. now. Uh, we will do our part in getting ourselves to organize. But we... Mr. Pande, did you, did you cut off? I'm sorry? Yeah, you cut off for, a, for, for about a minute. You were starting to talk about the Association of Lawyers. Please come again. No, I was saying we do have now... Um, an organization, Kenya US Bar Association, which has uh, many laws, over 60 laws spread across the country. Uh, what I was saying is that we hope uh, we can uh, get come, come together and work with local communities in various um, uh, locales so that we can share with the community about uh, legal issues that may affect them. Uh, but I wanted to uh, say that we must remain engaged uh, we cannot just live um, as though 
uh, we don't, we're not part of this community, we're not part of this country and so forth, because that's how we are left behind. We must take the front seat. Many of us who have been here uh, for a few years have accomplished what other people uh, in this country may not be able to accomplish in the entirety of their lives. And that's a great credit that we have to give ourselves. And it tells us that we can do a lot more than, because this country does provide that opportunity. The other thing I wanted to say is let us be a brothers and sisters keeper. So if you see someone having a problem and you can be of guidance to them, please reach out even on their behalf. Uh, by that, I'm not saying you start gossiping about their legal issues or about the problem they're having, but a genuine good faith uh, need to help a brother or a sister who is in need because uh, whenever something tragic happens, then we all are affected in one way or another. The other thing I wanted to say is having to participate in civic uh, engagements in this country. It goes back to what I was saying about uh, living on the sidelines. Uh, this country is a country of immigrants. We are immigrants here, so it's our country. And so therefore we need to participate, participate in local civic activities, run for office. My good uh, senior brother here, um, uh, brother Matemu, uh, recently ran for office uh, Congress from uh, North Carolina. Um, and I know many of us have the capacity to, to be able to do it uh, and represent because that's the only way that it makes sense when we are seen uh, at the front line. So participate in civic activities in your local areas, uh, as well as international. Uh, for those who are able to, uh, who have the right, for example, the right to vote, please exercise it. The other thing I wanted to say is um, we have a census that is coming up, and I know Professor Tissa is heavily involved in that. Uh, part of the participation is being known where we are and who we are. So if we're not able to be known, to be counted, uh, as a Kenyan uh, or African community in the U.S., then uh, as far as um, uh, the, 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 the government is concerned, then we don't exist. So some of the resources that come into uh, where we live come by virtue of our being counted, um, being known that we exist and we are there. So I think it's uh, uh, upon us, all of us collectively, to participate in some of these activities and not just be uh, passes by. Uh, I know a lot of people keep saying that I only came here temporarily and I'm going back. I know people who came 50 years ago are saying that, just as the one who came last year is still saying that they're going back. Yet we've been here and we'll, pro we'll spend our productive years in this country and it's about time that we get fully engaged. So thank you all of you for being here. It's a great honor to be here. We hope to be continuing with similar events in the future. Uh, once we find a good platform that we can be able to share. Thank you, and all be safe uh, as we enter the weekend. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Pande. I'd like to reiterate your uh, suggestion that we get involved politically, and even in the state of Ohio, I'm finding that, for example, the Somali community in particular is fairly organized, and it's um, more determined sometimes actually to go after some of the existing uh, government resources. Uh, and, and so we, the rest of us need to learn to, to be as, as, as organized. And, and yes, it's true, we may be wanting to go back home, uh, which becomes 50 years, but in the meantime, you are living your life here, so it's only necessary that actually we build ourselves here. Be besides, our kids are growing up in this country, so we need to be involved in the school boards. Uh, and by the way, one of the other things I'd like to encourage you is a lot of these states have what they call state commissions, for example, on, uh, on law, on healthcare, on any of these things. These are positions that actually you can be appointed to and actually help to bring visibility to issues of uh, immigrants and those types of uh, uh, issues. The census, uh, I couldn't have said it better, Laban Pande. Uh, I'm actually heavily involved in uh, making sure that African immigrants are counted. We're always perennially undercounted. We are always actually classified as difficult to count, which basically means we don't even fill the form when it comes to our house. This year, the census is fully online. Even if you threw away your password card, you can actually still go to census 2020 and you'll still be able to fill uh, the form. Uh, my easy way of saying it is that if actually, if you are not counted, you don't count, all right? So don't sure. complain. Don't complain about how the roads are not good, the schools are not good, and yet the government doesn't even know that you exist. Uh, somebody has mentioned that Every one of us that is not counted costs local governments 
anywhere from $2,500 to about $15,000 that actually can, can be used for roads, for schools, for the same hospitals that you need to take care of you uh, during uh, uh, COVID-19. So the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, uh, we do want to continue having these uh, discussions on Zoom uh, as much as we can. By the way, they always say that everything, even a dark cloud, has a silver lining. For me, the silver lining has actually been this ability for us even to come together as uh, Kenyan immigrants, African immigrants uh, on Zoom and find expertise within our own community that we didn't even know. Actually, uh, until we started planning this thing with Lapa Nopande, I didn't even know that there was a, uh, an association of, uh, uh, of Kenyan lawyers in the country. I mean, the Kenya-US Bar Association, I didn't even know it existed. Uh, we are finding out, uh, uh, Professor Gerono will tell you, some people don't even know that CASA exists. Uh, Kenya Scholars and Studies Association, and yet we have existed for about 10 years. So please, let's take advantage of the resources uh, in our own community. Going forward, don't shy from sending us information and the suggestions on what you'd like us to discuss. I don't have to be necessarily the one leading it, but uh, we now have enough people in our community that actually will be able to uh, moderate some of these discussions. And uh, uh, very quickly here, I know that uh, case has been mentioned a number of times, uh, Professor Gerono, I know you are, you are organizing something. Can you please announce it before people leave? Yes, just before that, I want to recognize my team who is here. Our vice president is here, Mr. Uh, Dr. Patrick Mose. Can you say hi, Patrick? Dr. Mose is a manager of Zoom and the technician, so he does all this work. All the Zoom sessions, Dr. Mose is in charge of that. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. Hello, guys. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. We also have Dr. Ongeri, who is our, on our board. Dr. Ongeri, Professor Ongeri, I saw you. She's right there. And then we have some students who came. We have another program called Kenya Students in Diaspora. I saw several students who joined in, so I want to thank all of you. Our next session, actually, Kessa will be having monthly series the fourth Thursday of every month from 8 p.m. Our next session is on the 21st, and we have Professor Ongeri, we have Dr. Mwalali, we have Dr. Uh, Dr. Ngetich, and then we have Dr. Ndege. Those are medical doctors, and the, the, the session, the topic for that is mitigating the complications, uh, conditions that make COVID worse. So what are some of those pre-existing conditions that make us more prone to COVID? Again, join us on the 21st. That is every fourth Thursday of the month, CASA will be having their series, and this will go throughout the year until we meet next day in Texas. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Feel at home at Kessa. This is Kessa home. All right. Before I, okay. Before I come to this one, I'd like you to prepare to pray for us. I wanted to mention here that uh, Council Jeff Matemas mentioned that he's running this year for the U.S. House Second District in North Carolina uh, as a libertarian. So those of you that are in that part of the state, please support him and. Uh, um, I might, um, we might even think of actually doing a special session on political involvement and uh, actually ask some of these people to uh, come here and tell us how you can, we can even support this uh, endeavor financially and uh, reaching out on WhatsApp and those types of things. It's about time, all right? Uh, so if I can go to Pastor Esmond, uh, please, you can close us out with a word of prayer and then we'll call it a day. Yeah, thank you and uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity and thank you all the panelists, thank you, Dr. Otiso, for um, hosting this. It's a great honor that we can all come together, but also trusting God that even as we get to hear from all the, you know, the professionals and get to hear all the, you know, the expertise that we have in our community, but we can still trust in God that in all these things, we know that God is going to see us through in everything. So let's put our thoughts and our mind together as we pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us tonight to come together as one people, to reflect and to discuss the times that we live in. Even as we look at the challenges that we are facing as a community, we know that all things work together for good to them that trust in you. We pray that even the things that have been raised, some of them that are affecting people among us, we pray that God, you're going to make a way out of this. We thank you, Lord, for the panelists that we have had today. We pray that you continue to bless them with great wisdom, knowledge, and even resources that they need to support this community. 
Thank you a lot for Dr. Otis and the team that has continued to organize these forums. As we come together as a people, we pray that you bind us together with one love, that we remain united to support one another. But much more, Lord, we remember that these are very challenging times, that even among us, we have people in the medical profession that are dealing, that are in the front line dealing with this situation. We pray that you protect them. As we continue to organize different forums to empower and equip our community, we pray that we look back and say that we are one and one in you. Tonight, as we discuss, may your love abound. May we never forget that if we remain united in you, we shall overcome. For thy word says how good and pleasant it is when your people dwell together in unity. Unite us from every part of this country and even beyond that we may remain one in you. We thank and give you praise. Give us peaceful night tonight. And even this weekend, we celebrate Mother's Weekend. We pray for all the mothers in our Mideast and even our mothers in this country and even overseas. May you continue to protect them. And even those mothers that have come home to be with you, for those of us who have lost our mothers, we pray that we have a moment of reflection to even cherish the moments that we shared with them. We give you praise and honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 All right.